Well, hi everyone, this is Bob the Science Guy, and today we're back for part two of my History of the Flat Earth Movement. Now, as you may recall in the introductory video, I talked about the rise of civilization from primitive man up until the first onset of agriculture and calendars. And again, it was just a brief video, only six minutes or so. It was not a doctoral dissertation on the anthropology of early man. And I think most people got that very nicely. There were a few that uh, pointed out a few things that I had left out, like migration patterns. And I left those out because I didn't think that they contributed to the overall history of the flat earth that I'm presenting. Now, today's video is going to deal with a fascinating subject to me, early seafaring and navigation. Now, a very interesting concept with these early civilizations is the division of labor. For example, there were people that were farmers. There were people that were soldiers. Another group of people that, you know, at least deserves a mention are what I call thoughtful observers. And these are the people that helped design and build the early astronomical observatories that made sense of the observations in the sky and gave some practical purpose to them. And since their ability to reason through what they saw in the sky had some value to society, they can in turn partially support themselves with it. This was the earliest beginnings of some of the professions. Now, as agriculture built, we began to develop trade networks where we would trade our corn for the beets over at the next village. However, uh, agricultural products, of course, are quite heavy. And we did discover early on that we could float those heavy objects in water and transport them much easier over distance. Rivers, in essence, became our highways. And as trade began to flourish and distances increase, we began to look beyond rivers and lakes into the open sea. And the vessels were operated by a new profession, mariners, and they became experts at their trade. Now, the efficient transport of goods by water involves the skill of navigation. What is a short and safe route to get goods from point A to point B? Now, initially, efforts at navigation consisted of pilotage, which is how we move around right now. If I want to drive over to Detroit, I get on a specific highway, take a specific exit, follow street signs to an address. This is going from point to point to point, and that is what pilotage is. It's under direct visualization, and it's basically navigation by landmarks. And in order to do that at sea, uh, it has to be daytime generally, and you have to be able to see the landmarks on the shore. So early maritime activities were limited by what you could get to along a shore or through landmarks. You couldn't go into open water, for example, where there are no landmarks and successfully navigate until you developed some sort of a science or a system of doing that. Now, the Phoenicians 4,000 years ago were the first real navigators over the open ocean. And they navigated without any of what we would consider normally modern instruments. Uh, they didn't have compasses. They didn't have a sextant or any of the usual tools that we would consider uh, when we talk about uh, old-timey navigation, so to say, or manual navigation in the ages before GPS, radars, etc. So how did they navigate? Well, there are a couple of hints in this image. Now, for example, they found that deeper water was darker than shallow water, and you could tell you were getting close to land if the water changed color. Another thing that they noticed was that in the morning, uh, seabirds left land and went out to sea to hunt, and in the evening, they flew back towards land. So by looking at the direction the birds were flying, they could get an idea of what the direction of land was. Either they were coming away from land in the morning, or they were going towards the land at night. You notice the pennant flags at the top of the masts. These were not only used to help set your sails, they were also there to give you an idea of the prevailing direction of the wind. And if you were sailing in an area where the winds traditionally came out of the south, you could tell which way was south by looking at the direction the pennant was flying. And just for completeness, we'll talk about the directions of currents would be known and the direction of the waves would also be known. So for example, if you were in a lee and there wasn't much wind, and you could see the direction the waves were coming from. Oh, one last thing. Now I know that the Vikings did this. I don't know if the Phoenicians did, but uh, it would make sense to me. Uh, the Vikings would trail a rope out behind the ship to tell whether or not they were continuing to go straight or they were tending to deviate one way or the other. It was just another way of maintaining their course. However, by far, one of the most significant contributions of the ancient Phoenicians was stellar navigation. Navigation by the nighttime stars. 
because they noted recognizable constellations in the nighttime sky. They knew the direction of the sunrise and the sunset. They knew the course of the moon through the sky. They noted that the stars rose in the east and set in the west. And the concept of third star from the right and on till morning came about. Now it's reported that the Phoenicians were using this technique as early as 2000 BC. Homer wrote in 800 BC of the Trojan War 400 years earlier and discussed navigation by the stars in both the Iliad and the Odyssey. So the concept of celestial navigation was quite well known in the ancient world. The Greek mariner Pythias, who literally deserves a series all to himself, ran the Carthaginian blockade of the Straits of Gibraltar in 400 BC and traveled not only to what is now Great Britain, he traveled far enough north to talk about ice flows and 24-hour sun. He passed the Arctic Circle and safely returned home. In addition, at about this time, about 400 BC, the Greeks began to develop the concept of Zonius. And what Zonius involved was the length of a shadow cast by a stick on the longest day. And they divided the world up into a cold region in the north, and a hot region in the south, and a temperate region in the middle. And these were one of the earliest indications of an understanding of the concept of latitude. Now, as you may be able to tell, we're at the point where we're going to start actually talking about how the shape and size of the Earth was initially determined. And that is based on classical Greek mathematics, uh, starting at around, oh, 200 to 400 BC. This is the time of Plato, of Aristotle, of Eratosthenes. So I hope you'll hit a like and subscribe and join me for the next episode. Thank you very much. This is Bob the Science Guy. See you soon.